Hi guys, in this video we are going to learn about artificial neural networks. So artificial neural networks or what are called ANNs are the most popular way of implementing supervised learning which is one of the paradigms of machine learning. There is another video on this uh, channel on supervised learning which I suggest you go through if you haven't already done so. Because to understand and appreciate what ANNs are trying to do, it's important to understand what supervised learning is all about. So let me just take you through a very brief overview of what supervised learning is. So essentially what we are trying to do is that we have this uh, set of inputs x1, x2, x3 up to xn which maps onto a certain set of outputs y1, y2, y3 up to ym and what we are trying to do in supervised learning is to estimate or approximate the function which relates the input to the output. Of course figuring out this function exactly is quite complicated and not possible in most real situations. Uh, but what we know from the universal approximation theorem that using ANNs we can find a solution or we can approximate this function to a very high degree of accuracy. And that is precisely why ANNs have become such an important tool for supervised learning. So supervised learning is a very important paradigm of machine learning and it has many many applications some of which are listed on your screen. Uh, for example handwriting and gesture recognition, face and object detection, language processing, speech recognition, spam detection and many others. So let's see what this artificial neural network is all about. Uh, so as you can uh, uh, you know see there is a word neural in the world artificial neural networks which essentially hints at the fact that this algorithm is inspired by our neurons in the brain. Uh, so one thing that we need to understand is that uh, this ANN is not exactly trying to mimic what's happening in the brain. So it's not an in, it's not a replication of the you know cognitive process because there are many elements of the cognitive process we don't even understand but it is just in some way inspired by how our neurons work, you know, nothing more than that. So what this ANN is all about? So ANN essentially connects the input and the output through what are called hidden layers. So in this ANN that you see on your screen, there is one input layer, there is one output layer and there is one hidden layer. So now an ANN can have many different hidden layers. It can be 2, 3, 4, 10, 20. Uh, however, there must be some hidden layers at least. So what happens is that your input parameters are in the first layer and the information passes through this uh, uh, you know, neural network and finally there are some mathematical uh, calculations that happen as the data flows from left to right and finally it reaches the output layer. So how is this information flow happening? So as this expression on your uh, computer screen shows that hi which is the ith input uh, uh, ith uh, value of the uh, you know hidden layer is equal to fa. fa is some activation function and its argument is summation over j aij into xj. So this summation aij into xj as you can see is a linear transformation. So what this step does is that it takes all the input values, it uh, makes them undergo a linear transformation and then it passes that value through this activation function which is inherently nonlinear. Now this is an important step because if you did not have this activation function then all that you would have are linear uh, you know computations and that would not help us because then all that we will have is an ability to estimate linear functions but that is not what we are trying to achieve over here. We are using ANNs specifically because we want to estimate nonlinear relationships or nonlinear functions between x and y between the input and the output and that is why we have to pass the linear transformation through a nonlinear function which is called activation layer. So now like we have calculated the hidden layer values from the input 
uh, uh, parameter values. Similarly, we calculate the output parameter values from the previous layer or the hidden layer in this case. So once again, like in the previous case, you see this expression on your computer screen uh, that yk is equal to fa uh, within bracket summation over i bki into hi. So again, this summation inside the bracket is a linear transformation and we again make it pass through this uh, function called activation function and as I just mentioned, this activation function is inherently a nonlinear function. This is very, very important so that we can estimate or approximate nonlinear functional relationships between the input and the output. So now the question is that, okay, that we have made this uh, neural network and we may be able to do some, uh, you know, learning algorithm, but uh, how exactly is it able to estimate functions? For example, you know, it looks like that once we have chosen our activation function, there should be only a small class of functions that we can approximate. However, there is something called the universal approximation theorem, which is a mathematical theorem, which has been proven, which says that even a neural network with a single layer. So this single layer can have many nodes here in this uh, particular example, you have a hidden layer with eight nodes, but a hidden layer could have as many nodes as you want, you know, 10, 20, 30, 100 million, there's no problem. So what this universal approximation theorem says is that this neural network with a single layer with some arbitrary number of nodes can approximate any arbitrary nonlinear function. Now that is why this ANNs are so so powerful that these ANNs do not represent only one category of nonlinear function. They are not you know one kind of nonlinear function but they are very very general in their nature and actually, as this theorem proves that uh, ANN with only a single layer can actually approximate any arbitrary nonlinear function. And that is why these ANNs are so, so powerful. Again, as I mentioned earlier, there are many different ways in which supervised learning can be done. But because of the universal approximation theorem and because of some algorithms available for learning, these ANNs have become very, very powerful. So now we have, let's say, some ANN with some number of hidden layers and some kind of connections. What exactly is the learning procedure which is happening? So now, uh, as uh, we will see an example of this later on, but essentially what is happening in ANNs is that uh, before uh, you know running the algorithm, the number of hidden layers, the number of nodes in each hidden layer, the kind of connections you have between individual layers, they are all pre-decided by the programmer. And what the algorithm learns are these parameters AIJ and BKI. So in your screen, you see two mathematical expressions, one for HI and one for YK. And inside the brackets of FA, there are these parameters AIJ and BKI, all of which are unknown a priori. So the objective of your uh, ANN algorithm is to run some kind of steps to learn what these AIJ and BKI parameters should be so that given a certain set of values in the input layer, you should be able to correctly predict the output layer with a very high probability. So again, exact prediction is never possible. You only want to be able to make a predictor with an error, which is low enough. And this is done by what is called the back propagation algorithm. So we are not going to get into any details of the back propagation algorithm because that requires uh, more time. But for now, what is important for you to understand is that uh, the meaning of back propagation is the following. So now, if let's say I knew these AIJs and all the other things in this ANN, then for a given value of the input layer parameters, I could calculate the output layer parameters. 
So now let's say if I initialize my ANN with some random values for AIJ and BKI, I then substitute the input layer parameters and then I get the output layer values. Now I compare these obtained output layer values with what the output values should actually be. So I can look at my data set and the data set has these output values. So I can compare the two. Now when I compare the two, I get to know the error between the predicted value and the value that should actually be. And now using this error, I can do a back propagation means I can update these uh, parameter these uh, you know coefficients a i j and b k i uh, sequentially from the output layer onwards to the input layer and then repeat this process again and again till I am able to correctly uh, you know uh, estimate what these a i j's and b k i's should be. So this is the way uh, you know your machine learning algorithm or your a n n algorithm is able to learn the function which you want to approximate. So this was a simple single layer ANN that we just saw and this is an example of a two hidden layer ANN. So here what happens is that your input layer parameters are your x1, x2, x3, x4 and x5. This is just an example. You could have many other you know numbers of input parameters. So these values are then fed into uh, the first hidden layer whose uh, uh, you know values are h1, h2, s3 and so on up to h8 using the same kind of function that we first do a linear transformation and then we pass the linearly transformed values through a activation function which is non-linear. Uh, so now we take these input layer values from h1, h2 up to h8 again carry out a similar transformation uh, using these values and obtain the values for the next hidden layer which is g1, g2, g3 up to g8 and then we take the values of this hidden layer make it undergo a linear transformation pass it through an activation function and then we get the values for our output layer y2, y3, y2, uh, y1, y2 and y3. So now you may ask uh, what should I choose for the activation layer because it was clear uh, what this linear transformation is that is very easy to uh, imagine but what about this activation function what kind of function should we choose now again there are many different possibilities that one can uh, you know pick up however the most common uh, you know options that people use uh, are what are what is called a sigmoid activation function and this ReLU activation function now which particular activation function to choose in a given problem and you know what kind of ANN to choose you know how many layers it should have how many nodes each layer should have now there is no hard and fast rule uh, you know or there is no you know simple algorithm which can tell you how to design these things now this comes from experience and also part of it comes from trial and error so for a given problem you have to uh, you know uh, you know pick up a certain network uh, network architecture see whether it works or not and if it works good enough if not then you have to go back and revise your ANN architecture and then after a few trial and errors if you are doing it wisely and intelligently you should be able to converge to something that works uh, good for you. So now let's uh, you know try to reiterate uh, these basic steps of machine learning using ANN uh, which we just uh, uh, you know saw. So the first step is that you need to divide your available data into training and testing sets. Now why is this important? This is because as we saw earlier while discussing linear regression that if you have a finite set of data points and you want to fit some kind of a nonlinear function to it, there are infinitely many possibilities. There are many many different kinds of functions which you can fit to any given finite data set. So now how do we know whether our uh, you know fitting was right or not and this is why a testing data set is very very important. So you use a training data set to train your ANN or any other machine learning algorithm and then you pass the, and you use the testing set or you apply that uh, you know learned uh, algorithm 
to your testing set to measure what kind of accuracy you will get. And this is why this division is very, very important. So now comes a question that, uh, you know, how should you divide your data set? Should it be 50, 50? Should it be 60, 40 or some other ratio? So now that again depends on how large your data is and on other uh, factors. But usually 70, 30 or 80, 20 also works very well, meaning that you have 70% uh, training data and let's say 30% of testing data, which is also what we are going to use in the example that we see in this workshop. Then the next step, of course, is to choose an appropriate ne network architecture. So as I mentioned, you can take uh, two layers in your network, three layers, you know, 10 layers, 50 layers. And again, you can take eight nodes in your each layer or 20 nodes or 100 nodes. Now, all these things are, you know, kind of uh, things which the programmer needs to decide and design. A part of that also comes from experience. Or you can also look up the literature for similar problems. For example, if you are doing some image, uh, image classification uh, using some ANN, uh, you could look up the literature for uh, what other people have done and you know what kind of architectures they have used. Or you could use your own experience or you could use some trial and error and then try to come up with the most appropriate architecture for your problem. So this may not be like a one-time process. You may have to, you know, after your steps are over, if your results are not satisfactory, you may have to come back again and repeat the whole process till you get what you actually desire. Then the next step is to choose an appropriate activation function for each layer. Now again, as you saw that, uh, first of all, the values of each layer, they are passed through a linear transformation. There is no choice over there. That is how this ANN algorithm is designed. However, you have a choice in the activation function. There is a sigmoid function, ReLU function, and there are other kinds of activation functions also, which you might use. So now again, how to choose an appropriate uh, activation function? That again uh, uh, follows the same concept as uh, choosing an appropriate network architecture. So there also you have to, you know, see what others have done in related problems. Uh, you have to sometimes use your experience and sometimes you have to just use trial and error. But as I said, uh, in this uh, workshop, there's an example that we'll see. Uh, we'll use a ReLU activation function for the hidden layers and the sigmoid activation function for the final layer. Now uh, you have to, once your network architecture is decided, once your activation function is also decided, you are now all set to train your network using the back propagation algorithm, which I just briefly explained to you in the previous slide. So back propagation, as I said, is about updating the parameter values of your network based on the error that you obtain at the output. We are again not getting into too much details of what back, back propagation means, uh, but I hope you get the basic idea of, you know, what is actually happening when your algorithm is learning. So essentially your, your network has been decided, your activation function has been decided. So what the algorithm learns using back propagation is the values of the various coefficients which are used for doing the linear transformation when you take the information from one layer to the next layer. And then finally, once you have trained your network, now you need to run the trained ANN on the test data to find your accuracy. So if your accuracy is good enough, then you are done. But if your accuracy is not good enough, then you need to go back and repeat the whole process again. Now again, how much accuracy is good enough again depends on various problems. In some problem, even 80% could be good enough. In some other problems, you know, even 95% may not be good enough. So it, uh, you know, depends. And the other thing to remember over here is that, uh, you know, let's say in the first step, you divided your data into training and testing set. And usually this is done randomly. Uh, we will again see a, a simple command to do that. However, what has been, uh, you know, found in machine learning community is that depending on how you divide your uh, data into training and testing, the accuracy may change, uh, you know, drastically. So again, in machine learning community, it is generally advised that you run the same algorithm 10 times and each time you, uh, you know, do this division of training and testing randomly so that there is some kind of, you know, better validation of your 
accuracy results because you know otherwise what may happen is that you know you may run this algorithm once and get 95 percent accuracy you may think you have cracked the problem but if somebody picks up uh, you know a slightly different uh, data set uh, you know they may get a very low accuracy which is not really good for any uh, any kind of a prediction algorithm 